Good morning and welcome. I'm Caitlin Welsh, Director of the Global Food Security Program at CSIS. We're very glad you joined us today. We've assembled an expert panel to address the question during the COVID-19 pandemic, are we heading toward another global food price crisis? We'll look at the effects of food export bans that as of today, 16 food exporting countries have put in place. From our experience in 2007 and 2008, we know that when countries restrict their food exports, global food supplies fall, global food prices rise, and people go hungry with impacts on political stability, economic growth, and human development. This morning, we'll also look at the many other effects of COVID-19 on global food security, as we're seeing on the news every day in our country and around the world. Today, Today, labor, labor shortages, shortages threaten, threaten our food, our food supply. supply. When, un when unprotected workers, workers fall, fall ill, Ill forcing, forcing food, food processing, processing plants, plants to close, to close. And, when and when seasonal, seasonal workers work. can't cross borders to harvest fruits and vegetables. Food supplies fall short when consumers panic shop, leaving grocery store shelves empty. Historic rates of unemployment are taxing food banks, and food banks can't keep up with new demand. Access to food is restricted when markets are closed to enforce social distancing. During the pandemic, we're concerned about the availability of nutritious food, as proper nutrition is necessary to boost our immune systems and recover from disease. And as lockdowns leave day laborers without jobs or food, the IMF warns that new waves of social unrest could erupt in some countries. I'm sure you've seen headlines on all of these issues over the past month. In today's event, we wanna help you separate the signal from the noise. We want to help you make sense of the news you're reading, to take steps to protect your community, and to encourage your governments to enact smart policies. I'm pleased to have three distinguished panelists with us this morning. Dr. Joe Glauber, Ndidi Nunelli, and Dana Bolden. Together, we'll examine the impacts of COVID-19 on the global agricultural system including export restrictions, plus other ways the pandemic is threatening global food security. We'll look at impacts on agri-food business and consumers in West Africa, and we'll also discuss impacts on U.S. agribusiness. I'll spend a few minutes moderating discussion among our panelists, after which I'll pose your questions to them. Please submit your questions using the Ask Live Questions Here button on our event page. Now, on to our distinguished panelists. Dr. Joe Glauber is a senior research fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI, in Washington, DC, where he studies food price volatility, global grain reserves, crop insurance, and trade. Prior to joining IFPRI, Dr. Glauber spent over 30 years at the US Department of Agriculture, including as chief economist from 2008 to 2014. For part of this time, Joe was also a special envoy in the office of the US Trade Representative. Joe is joining us today from Washington, D.C. Joe, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my first question for you, Joe, is, um, again, 16 food exporting countries have put up uh, export restrictions. How worried should we be? Yeah, I know that's it, it's certainly a cause for concern, Caitlin. The, if you look, as you say, 16 countries, they represent about 7% of bulk grain trade. So that's, you know, sizable. Compared to 2007-8, however, uh, much, much smaller. Back then, we had up to three, 33 countries at one time putting on trade restrictions, uh, and they were representing around 25% of bulk trade. So uh, the concerns have been with uh, major wheat exporting countries like Russia and Ukraine and rice exporting countries like Vietnam. The good news is uh, most of these restrictions have been temporary. Uh, they're supposed to go off in a few weeks. And for the most part, we don't think, believe they're binding. That is the, the levels they've set are less than, uh, are, are greater than the levels that they actually export at this time of year. 
What is it would be a concern is as we go into the harvest season, uh, do we see these restrictions continue? And, and, and again, supplies are plentiful in the world. Uh, we do have a little bit of dryness in Southern Europe and, and, and parts of Russia, but otherwise the crop forecasts look, look good. Uh, we'll know a lot more in the next couple of months, but I think the key right now is to contain and reduce such actions like, like trade bans. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe. Um, again, the export restrictions that we're seeing today are reminding some people of, of what we were seeing in 07 and 08 um, when there was the, the global food price crisis um, that had impacts all over the world. Um, at that time, there were, there, was, there were some other things going on in 07 and 08 that make that period different from what we're experiencing right now. Can you help draw uh, uh, to help us contrast these two scenarios? Yeah, no. I the back in two thousand seven eight. Remember, we had really high oil prices. Contrast that now, where we're we're really looking at some of the lowest prices we've seen in twenty some odd years. Um, not only low energy prices, but low commodity prices generally. Uh, we have seen an uptick in wheat prices for indica rice, one of the rice varieties. We've seen a, a little bit of uptick. Um, but for the most of the other commodities like maize and soybeans, those prices are at, at very low uh, levels. Um, the other thing though is that COVID has really hit the marketing chain in a very different way uh, than say just a drought, like what we saw with droughts and other things that precipitated the price, uh, the price crisis in 2007, eight, um, particularly for commodities that are labor intensive, uh, like fruit and vegetable production or dairy production. Uh, there we see some potential labor issues, uh, that is people getting ill and not being able to uh, get the harvesting done or labor not being able to cross borders and other sorts of things by, because of uh, policies countries have put on. The other thing has been in, in meat processing plants. Here in the US, of course, that's been a very big thing with several large pork processors, beef processors and poultry processors having to close a plant uh, uh, while they disinfect and get, get the production back online. And then uh, lastly is there distribution issues. So we, because people are sheltered in place, we're having uh, uh, people aren't going out to restaurants. And so as a consequence, that food is, that is normally slotted to go to restaurants is having to be uh, replumbed and, and set to other areas of the, uh, like grocery stores. And, that's not a perfect match. And so we see disruptions and shortages and other sorts of things. But these are these are temporary, I think. I think once the, uh, hopefully once the incidence rate declines and, and some immunity is, is brought back, uh, that, that these sorts of problems should be alleviated. Yeah, okay, okay, great, thanks. Um, I'd like to turn to, um, to uh, government response right now. Um, uh, I'd like to know what you, what actions you think national governments should take and what actions they should avoid to safeguard food security for their citizens. And I, I think I might know your position on this issue from an article that you wrote uh, that was titled Trade Restrictions are the worst possible response to safeguard food security, but uh, I want to pose the question now anyway. Yeah, I won't put those high up on the list. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do think that governance, uh, governments need to address these bottlenecks and, and particularly flow of labor and things like that. I think to the degree that they can facilitate that and help these people who are gonna be assisting with harvests and, and planning and other things, uh, that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously improving biosecurity protocols. I mean, people are looking at this for the first time and how do you a lot of these operations like meat processing plants, people are, are working very, very closely together. How do you get protective shields? How do you take temperatures of people coming in? Hopefully there will be uh, uh, better tests, more rapid tests uh, for COVID that we'll be able to uh, uh, address some of these issues. But the critical thing here is avoid adverse trade uh, uh, actions. It, it, it really is, it's one of those things that can really snowball into a very, very large problem. It's like the people you're at watching a, a basketball game, the people in the row in front of you stand up, you have to stand up too. The people in back of you have to stand up mm -hmm. and, and you need everyone just to sit down, calmly uh, address the situation. That can be done by improving market information. Uh, one of the outcomes of the price crisis back in 2007, eight is uh, in 2011, a group called the Agricultural Market Information 
service was, uh, our system was created to improve market information. So policymakers have a better idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the other thing is for those countries that are putting on restrictions, report those actions to the WTO because uh, there, I think it, at the bare minimum, what's needed is transparency. Yeah. Okay. And and your organization is doing a really good service for all of us by by um, gathering information that's in the public domain and reporting that, so we can see which countries are are applying export restrictions on what on what products and for how long. So so yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Um, last Thanks. question for you is also on trade and. Um, uh, there's an, an article that I saw you wrote um, five or six months ago about trade policy and food security. And you said, to the extent that international trade in agricultural commodities improves food security with a country, the importance of international trade is likely to increase in the near and more distant future. Now, you wrote that before the pandemic. So would, would, your, would, would the pandemic cause you to change this conclusion? No question that the pandemic is going to change the way global uh, food chains, I think, operate. I think there, there's uh, what's seen here is that to, to be resilient, a lot of flexibility is needed. And so I think people are obviously going to build a lot of the lessons that they're learning here into the system. But as far as trade is concerned, no, I think it, it will only grow. And that's because income and population and other sort of the big drivers that everyone knows, those things are going to continue. Uh, unfortunately, production isn't grown everywhere in quite the same way it's grown in some areas of the world. And so some uh, trade is going to have to be there to facilitate moving production from surplus areas to deficit areas to, to ensure that consumer tastes and preferences are, are fulfilled. And, and so I think that that can only intensify and layer on top of that climate change, which I think will also shift uh, production into other areas. And if we are really, at the end of the day, going to mitigate those impacts, I think trade is very important, which just points to why further liberalization in the global trade system is necessary. And we really need to get back on to that agenda at some point. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, certainly a, a, a fantastic person to advise us on these things, given your experience at USDA and USTR and IFPRI as well. So thanks. Thank you again for your time. Thanks very much. We'll come back to a few of these issues in a few minutes. Great. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you again, Joe. Um, I'd like to turn to our second panelist, Ndidi Nwaneli. Ndidi is a co-founder of Sahel Consulting Agriculture and Nutrition Limited, and she serves as its managing partner. Ndidi has 23 years of experience in international development, she started her career with McKinsey Company, serves on the board of directors for the Rockefeller Foundation and other organizations, and is a TED Global Speaker. Ndidi is joining us from Lagos, Nigeria today. Ndidi, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, My pleasure. Great yeah, to thank you. Uh, I know it's a little bit later your time, but again, thank you. Um, and uh, Nigeria, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you saw the cover of the New York Times today, but there is a picture of Maiduguri on the, on the front page of New York Times. So, so certainly what, what's happening around the world is hitting our news, um, but I'd just like to hear from you. Can you tell us about the impacts of, of COVID on food security uh, that you're seeing right now? Yeah, so it's already uh, hitting our countries. Um, obviously, Africa started uh, seeing some of the COVID cases in early March. And what we saw is our countries for following the West's example and initiating lockdowns. And mm -hmm. in the last few weeks, we've basically seen distortions and disruptions in the movement of food across from farm farmers to the markets from we're also seeing uh, issues around fertilizer distribution and seed distributions and we're starting the planting season in many of our countries and so this is creating a lot of cause for concern because we're seeing price hikes in our local markets prices have increased from 20 to 60 percent depending on the product and already many of our vulnerable populations survive on a daily basis based on what they do. And with our major cities and the lockdowns, we mm -hmm. are starting to see a rise in, in unrest um, and a lot of communities being affected. And this mm -hmm. is raising concerns around um, not only food security, but deepening malnutrition and stunting, and also the potential political unrest in some communities that it can create. So yeah. right now the scene on the ground is not so positive. But a few of our states, at least in Nigeria, are still functioning. 
especially those that do not have COVID cases at the moment. About 22 of our states have COVID cases and the rest don't. Um, so protecting those states and ensuring activity continues is what we're hopeful about. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I actually heard earlier this week that there were three governors in Nigeria who themselves um, have COVID. So yes. um, hoping for their quick recovery themselves. Um, question for you, and, and I think that you, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, Nigeria has not only a very strong agriculture sector, but it's also very highly urbanized. So, um, and, and you're seeing impacts of COVID in, in both regions and rural and in urban areas on food security, is that right? Yes, so in the cities, we still have a lot of open air markets, not just in the cities, in urban communities. And when you lock down cities and lock down markets, it definitely affects the average person's access to food. Um, and what we're seeing is uh, information asymmetry. So there's a, a glut in our farms because they can't move the produce from the rural areas to the urban areas. Mm. Um, and the, the limited data that Joe talked about and the challenges around knowing where there's a surplus and where there is a shortage is also affecting us. But the logistical challenges um, are really the biggest issue because the bottlenecks created by the blockades uh, with governors restricting um, trucks from coming to their states for obvious reasons. They don't want a transfer of COVID into their state, but the protectionism has you know, short-term benefits, but long-term and medium-term consequences, especially when you're entering the planting season. Um, if agro-dealers can get their inputs, then we're not going to be able to have the yields that we need. And six months from now, we might be facing an even bigger challenge with more people dying from hunger than COVID. And so that's what really keeps me up at night is this concern. Um, even in Lagos, the city where I live in, which has about 20 million people, we're starting to see um, significant unrest because we don't have very good um, food distribution mechanisms um, and the state is trying its best, but when you have a city with 20 million people and majority of them sitting at home without access to a daily wage, you're going to have angry youth. Um, mm -hmm. And we're starting to see more of them in our streets, which for yeah. me is a very, very worrisome development. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you, you anticipated my next question, which is what, what do you see as the, the medium and longer term effects of this? Um, so welcome your additional thoughts on that. But I'd also like to talk about what responses you think um, your state governments and national government should be taking to address this? Well, so in terms of uh, res what we see as the impact, I mean, the World Bank has basically estimated that African economies could contract uh, significantly if urgent action is not taken, mm -hmm. and that we might actually see ne negative growth rates between negative two and negative five, which for me is very worrisome. We can actually turn back almost 20 years of growth on our continent if we don't take urgent action. In terms of output, I mean, the estimates are that we could actually have lower output for our grains and major um, commodities, which we do export from this region to the rest of the world of 20 to 50% if urgent action is not taken. So what mm -hmm. am I suggesting? I think for one, we need to develop very, very clear protocols for how we ensure safety and health while ensuring the free movement of goods and people and inputs right now across our states and across West Africa and across the entire continent. We also need to figure out as, as governments how to prioritize food security and recognize farmers and workers in the entire ecosystem as essential. Just like we're prioritizing healthcare, we need to prioritize food because food is medicine. And I think that there's unfortunately, um, a lot of focus only on health, which is important, but we're neglecting the importance of food protocols as well, and workers mm -hmm. in the food industry. And then finally, we need to enable trade within West Africa and across mm -hmm. Africa. I think in our continent, we have a lot of potential. And this is, might be a good time for Africa to look in and say, how can we ensure food security and food self-sustainability on the continent? And how can we work across borders? And this means that the regional economic communities have to work together to ensure trade at this time. And then we actually have to invest in a lot more backward integration and processing, which means we have to create an enabling environment. We need our financial institutions to rise up like the institutions in the West are doing to provide subsidies and um, de-risk investment in the sector because we're gonna need a lot of recovery for our SMEs. Unfortunately, a lot of our SMEs are being affected at this time. So there's an urgent need to think about business development support mm -hmm. and 
financing to enable the sector to continue to thrive at this time. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it's amazing how we're considering a lot of the same um, solutions to address these problems, um, no matter what wh where we are around the world. Um, last question for you is about, about nutrition. Um, uh, you and I talked a little bit earlier this week and, and, and you mentioned again right now um, about food being medicine. So nutrition is important uh, in a lot of different ways in this pandemic. Can you, can you talk about that? Definitely. I mean, there's no way you can stay healthy if you don't have access to food. COVID is a disease that affects our immune system and it affects our body functions. And what we are seeing in a lot of our countries is that if our, our elderly are vulnerable because they're malnourished, then there's going to be a higher mortality rate. So for me, it's critical that we think about food as part of the COVID solution, nutritious food in mm -hmm. particular, especially for the most vulnerable populations, the under five and the uh, elderly, and obviously now pregnant women as well, mm -hmm. who are really affected. Um, and so we really need to unlock the bottlenecks that we've placed in the food value chain, especially for fruits and vegetables. And that's why I think protocols around safe handling is critical and broad-based awareness because we really need to think about how we're educating consumers about how to be careful, but also um, how to ensure that they're eating right at this time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Indeed, either, for just helping us um, uh, envision this, the many ways we're thinking about food and food secur security during the pandemic. Thank you. We'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, thank you. And on to, on to our third expert panelist, uh, Dana Bolden. Dana serves as Senior Vice President for External Affairs and Chief Sustainability Officer at Corteva AgriScience, where he leads the company's public policy and government affairs strategies, in addition to its sustainability, product stewardship, and global regulatory activities. Dana joined Corteva from the Coca-Cola Company. And today, Dana joins us from Atlanta, Georgia. Dana, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Caitlin. Appreciate you having us on. I hope everybody's staying healthy and well during these uncertain times. Good. Thank you. Thank you. First question for you, Dana. How has COVID-19 affected ag productivity across Corteva's operations? Well, we have a fairly unique perspective in that our, our route to market model allows us to touch farmers on a daily basis. So we are on the farms. We're behind the farm gates around the world every day. And it is, uh, much like Ndidi said, it is not a one-size-fits-all sort of uh, impact. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, depending on the size of your farm, we're seeing uh, different impacts. The, the, the headline here, though, is that uh, to date, this is a short-term response, to date, that the impact on ag has been minimal. Um, we're sorry, we are starting to see some prices fluctuating, as Ndidi said. You know, in Nigeria, we, we, we've seen um, prices rise uh, for the cost of uh, rice and retail markets. Um, we've also seen egg prices in the U.S., um, yes rise to record highs just because grocers are trying to, you know, to stock that demand for everybody staying home uh, and, and eating in, in more meals. Um, and we'll probably in the short term see some spikes in meat and fish and, and perishable commodities. But you, know, you balance that against the, seeing some prices dropping uh, in corn, for example, due to reduced ethanol demand. So again, mm -hmm. it's a bit of an uneven sort of impact for folks as, as we're seeing this. But the, 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 the headline again is, is that it's been minimal impact in the U.S. and developed economies. If you're a smaller farmer, especially those that had tailored markets going to restaurants, you've seen the headlines where uh, folks who had small operations who sold directly to restaurants are, are, are being um, caught off guard and, and finding some challenges because there is no demand for that that, that food that they were producing right now. Uh, and so, it, you know, I've heard someone say the other day, it's not an availability issue. We have a lot of food. It's just the channel issue of trying to get it to the right place. And so there are some pretty serious impacts for those who are small farmers, minority farmers, and those who are historically dis dis disadvantaged. But but overall, I think ag in general is seeing minimal impacts of this. And you know, depending on how long this goes on, uh, Joe talked about trade impacts, and, and that will obviously uh, affect the long-term health. But if this continues on the trend that we're seeing today, where you know, we're, we're seeing the back end of the curve, I, I think farmers in general will be okay in the short term. Then what we need to look for is the trade agreements that Joe referenced and making sure that they still have access to markets to continue to sell. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, one thing uh, that, that, that's quite interesting about Corteva, you have operations in 42 countries, um, including many developed countries and developing countries. Um, among your customers are 50 million smallholder farmers. So can you disaggregate or help us envision the impacts you're seeing in uh, developed countries with very strong ag agriculture sectors and then in developing countries? 
Sure. Uh, so, and I'll start with the the uh, the emerging or developing countries as, in that perspective. I mean, you know, those those farmers are historically uh, challenged. They're also, but they're also the key to solving food security challenges for us. I mean, uh, you know, we 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 look at making sure how we empower those smallholder farmers to use a lot of the technology from the from the um, from the developed world, and so they, while well, again they are being impacted because of uh, availability, a lack of availability of labor. You know, if someone on a smallholder farm gets sick, that's the entire operation. There's no opportunity to bring someone else in. Uh, mm-hmm. With the developed markets, they're 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 weathering the crisis a bit better because of technology, because of uh, both the, the the technical computer uh, tractor kind of technology that people think of, but also better access to biotech, you know, different kinds of seeds that are more resilient and hardy, and so. One of the things that we're seeing as a result of this is there's a lot better or a lot more information sharing that's happening between developed and the, and the emerging markets around there in terms of sharing technologies and making mm-hmm. sure that uh, those smallholder farmers and those in the smaller countries that don't, don't have the benefit of access to certain types of seeds are now starting to see the benefit of those seeds. And, and you know, you, you, you are hopefully going to uh, ultimately impact some policy discussions about cross-border technologies should this continue, uh, you know, that's one of the trends that we're starting to see emerge is that those discussions about cross-border technology are becoming, uh, getting ramped up and there's more demand in markets where those uh, products have typically or historically been blocked. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> another question I have for you, and you, I think you started to answer this a bit um, in, in your earlier remarks, is um, about some vulnerabilities that this pandemic has made us aware of. Um, can you talk from your own experience? Are there vulnerabilities um, that, that, that you weren't aware of before? And, and what are you taking to, what steps are you taking to safeguard against those? Oh, well, there's absolute vulnerabilities. I mean, you know, we, we talked about that having a great supply, but not having a destination for some of those things. So we've mm-hmm. understood now that as our customers, the farmers around the world look at markets, they've got to have better information and better predictive capabilities to understand the, the, the demands. And, and mm-hmm. you know, one of with the closure of ethanol plants, with the closure of the Smithfield uh, um, plant that we saw in Sioux City uh, due to the contamination and the need to clean that facility, uh, the dumping of milks, you know, the, the school cafeteria is closing. We're starting to see where the, the links in the food chain are broken. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so, again, unfortunately, it's, 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 it's impacting the least of those uh, in the world. But, but one of the things I like to think about is this, this has given us an opportunity to, to look at where we have broken links in that food chain and address them. And, and there are a lot of forward thinking folks in the industry who are doing that. I mean, if you think about it, even before COVID, there were 820 million people suffering from food insecurity. That's a huge number. Uh, this number is going to spike in the short term because of the things that we just talked about. And so we, we've got to really help the person who typically would not have an interest in the food chain or the food system to understand this is a complex, you know, environmental, economic, and social uh, um, uh, food chain that we have. There has to food tw- have to feed 10 billion people by 2050. And so time like these, we recognize it's imperfect, but it's fixable. And I would encourage people not to panic. Uh, you know, this crisis as you know as significant as it's been and the deaths that, that, that continue to mount it has also forced that discussion about okay how do we ensure we get food to the least of those on a regular basis but protect it for incidents like this because there will be another incident I mean, it may not be COVID but there'll be some other challenge that disrupts the food chain and so my, my, my counsel and the discussions that we have is you know let's use this opportunity while we've got interest while we've got resources to, to figure out how we shore up those weak links in that food chain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and when you and I talked a little bit earlier, you also talked, we talked a bit about how um, this is an opportunity and it seems like it is an opportunity to identify those weak links, strengthen this, strengthen the uh, uh, food supply chains and food systems for the next crisis, whatever that is. Correct. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, the, the I think one of the, the most, um, the biggest opportunities that we have here is if you think about broadband, broadband in rural areas is always uh, been a discussion that has been isolated to a few small communities. And I think what people are saying now, you think about the human act in, uh, impacts. I'm a farmer. I've got to get up every morning and go out. Well, now my kids are at home. And, and you know, somebody in my house has to teach those kids uh, but, you know, to keep the schoolwork going and continue the lesson planning. We're saying around the world, there are pockets of the U.S., but around the world where broadband is not readily accessible to a lot of our farming communities. 
And, you know, the U.S. president the other day talked about the opportunity to sort of double down the investment because you're, you're seeing in the U.S. or in developed markets, it's a challenge because kids are needing to get access to that education, that, that, that sort of game plan, if you will. But in rural areas, uh, even those uh, farmers who don't have children, they're being denied access to market data. And the one thing that we have to do as agriculture or farmers is have certainty. You know, we get a lot of uncertainty from other nature. We get a lot of uncertainty from local governments. Having greater access to broadband and technology allows us to understand, you know, the, gives us access to data, agronomy data, understanding better mm-hmm. planting, but also helps us understand the markets. And it, cha- it addresses that challenge we talked about earlier, knowing that if I, if I have a specialty um, uh, crop that I'm selling to a local restaurant, you know, I can begin to think about, okay, what do I do next? Where, where, what's my game plan? How do I plot where this food can go next? If I can't go to a restaurant, can it go to a school? Uh, and there was that, that access to technology is helping to, 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 to bridge that divide. And then lastly, you know, they are, our customers, farmers in particular, have to have access to financial services. And most of those are being delivered via, via broadband. And so, you know, that, that if you're in a rural area uh, and you're in a crisis like this, you're getting a double whammy because you're having to come out of the field you're having to do work that you know you normally wouldn't do in terms of keeping your family unit intact and making sure your kids stay on track. But then you don't have access to some of that data, and particularly the agronomy data. So one of the upsides for this is I hope that we can continue to keep the focus on greater broadband investment in rural areas around the world. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dana. You did a great job of, of, of helping us understand that food security is not just about agricultural productivity. It's about so many other things, access to broadband, access to financial services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, just a, a very, very complex and obviously very important thing. Um, uh, thank you again for your for your remarks, and um, like to turn to um, to all of us again to bring everybody together, um, just for a quick discussion before we turn to questions from our audience. Um, great, and is Ndidi with us as well? Okay, great. Good. Thank you all again for being with us. I think that we're, we're all very lucky to have you here in one place to help us make sense of the news that we're reading and to help us uh, take actions to protect for our, our own food security. Um, I want to start uh, by asking you, Joe. Joe, is there anything that you'd like to remark on based on what you heard from Indidi and Dana? Well, I, I do think the, the, the near term is all about sort of this, this disparity between ample supplies on the one hand at the, at the producer level and uh, you know a, a paucity of of supplies at the consumer level. Uh, the just you you really see the supply chain really being tested right now. And I think Dana is absolutely correct. I think people are going to learn from this experience, hopefully, and build in some um, uh, you know more resilience that we're being able to uh, uh, adjust more rapidly to these sorts of situations. And you're beginning to see it, but uh, again, it's the real challenge in the near term, I think. And and again, I can't help but getting back to the fact that this can only be made worse if, um, uh, as indeed he mentioned, uh, you know, stopping trucks at the border of coming into your province or your country because of, of, of fears about this. Let's try to take a very sensible approach and, and uh, minimize the disruptions for uh, basic things like food and other, other sorts of supplies. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Joe, Indidi, any, any, any more comments from you? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree with both uh, Dana and Joe. And I specifically wanted to underscore the role of SMEs in the agriculture value chain. Um, We're starting to see that they're being hit, not just in in Nigeria, but across the world. And um, they are the drivers of this ecosystem. Um, Not just farmers at one end, but all the aggregators, the input providers, the processors. And through our research, we've shown that about 50% of them have had to shut down. Um, in the short term, and we're optimistic that they will actually be able to recover and revive. Um, But this is an opportunity for them to also rethink their business models and retool. Because as Dana said, we're going to continue to face shocks going forward, different types of shocks, climate change, other pandemics, and how are we building resilient companies that leverage technology um, and that really are demand-driven. Um, and so we really need to think through, and I've been spending a lot of time working with entrepreneurs to, to refine their models, but also to prepare for the future. And I'm optimistic that this is a, a tough a lesson, a tough learning uh, environment, but we're going to have to learn quickly so that we can ensure that we 
emerge stronger and that we build more cohesive and dynamic ecosystems. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I have a question for all of you, and that's about uh, what we can anticipate as as the challenges. Um, so not not in the medium or long term, but just right ahead of us, because um, what the, uh, the nature of the challenges are changing on a daily basis or a weekly basis. So, for example, this time two weeks ago, we weren't thinking about um, meat plant closures because they hadn't hit us the way that they are right now. Uh, two weeks ago, we were con- more concerned with food export restrictions, but I think that those um, if, if governments stay calm, then the impact of those should be should be limited. Um, so, what what do you think we should be thinking about in the next in the next few days, or let's take it like a week or two weeks? But what are what are the what are the things that might be headlines in the future that we're not quite seeing yet? What do you, Dana? Do you have any any thoughts on that? Uh, Caitlin, I think my headline would be you know, cooler heads need to prevail in this crisis. And Didi touched on some of the behavior that she's seeing there in Nigeria. There are pockets around the world where people are hoarding and stockpiling. You know. Overall, food prices are still well below the peaks of 2008 and 2011 due to the stockpiles we've had. So the last few years, food prices have been relatively low to plentiful supplies. And, and according to the U.S. government, the USDA, global wheat reserves and rice reserves are, are still at an all-time high. So the prices should stabilize. Um, the, the oil slump that we're seeing you know, should help keep costs down for farmers, and that typically translates to lower food prices. So you know, the policymakers who are looking at what's happening today uh, around the world and those uh, regulators around the world, we all just need to be careful not to repeat the mistakes of 2007, 2008, the food crisis, and that's hoarding, it's export restrictions, a lot of things that Joe talked about. And and let's really turn this into an entirely avoidable food crisis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Joe, any thoughts from you about what what we might be seeing in a a few days or weeks? Well, I think, you know, obviously the, there are, uh, t- uh, times during the production process, agricultural production process, where, you know, for example, during the harvest season for, for fruits and vegetables, if we, we are seeing some of that uh, uh, going on right now, um, hopefully labor movements will be eased and that people will be able to, to um, uh, do that without risk of getting ill or, or um uh, but the other big thing I think is, uh, as we've gone through this period of lockdowns, I think uh, uh, both uh, Dana and Aditi pointed out that that there is a lot of unrest about that. If people are are that's going to be an, a difficult thing to enforce. Uh, mm-hmm. I think the danger of coming off lockdowns too fast also uh, poses a potential health risk. These are sort of outside of, I mean, a lot of a lot of economic activities will be affected by that. But that's the balance I think these policymakers are going to have to uh, figure out and hopefully do wisely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So thank you for that. And um, I'd like to turn to questions from our audience. Um, And uh, we've got a a good few questions that that we've received. Um, First question is going to be, um, it's going to be for um, Ndidi, and it's actually about, um, about the locust infestations that we're also seeing across parts of Africa and, and parts of Asia. Um, this question is, um, is from a field program associate, associate located in Kenya. The question is for Ndidi. Um, and the question is, any insights on the effects that the combination of locusts and COVID-19 will have on countries within East Africa? How should governments prepare and how should they prioritize these things? Thank you so much. I mean, we were on a call yesterday with key stakeholders across the board and everybody has talked about the immense impact that both the COVID and the low cost and the oil shocks are gonna have on our economy. And the governments need to respond with a lot of subsidies and grants in the short term. And some of them are starting to think about it. Um, And then also a lot of input support and protectionism. Um, We're going to need to see a lot of um, partnerships, and this is key, partnerships amongst leaders in the food sector. This is not a time for competition, this is a time for partnership, and so the private sector needs to rise up in many of our countries in East Africa to actually support smallholder farmers and to support the ecosystem. And it's going to take some sacrifice, but we're going to need to see that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to do a quick plug for an event that we will be hosting on this issue on the locust infestations. It's on April 29th, and CSIS is hosting this in collaboration with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, 
My next question is a question for, um, for any and all panelists. Um, uh, this is a question from a, a private viewer. What do you see as the role of in as what do you see the role of international financial institutions like the African Development Bank, World Bank, EFAT, et cetera, in supporting smallholder farmers? And I'm going to actually ex expand that question because it's not just smallholder farmers who are affected, it's, uh, it's restaurant owners in cities, it's, tr it's truckers who, who, who move between rural areas and urban areas every day. So uh, again, what do you see as the role of international financial, financial institutions in people working at all across food systems? Um, I can take that. I think historically, a lot of our large international finance uh, organizations have focused on commercial banks as their inroads or on the development banks. And sadly, very little financing goes to those who need it, the SMEs and the um, farmers. So I'd like to see a lot more focus on partnering with business development service providers, local operators and supporters to channel this financing exactly where it's needed. I'd also like to see them invest in de-risking instruments, insurance instruments, especially micro insurance and partner with clusters and more nonprofits because otherwise the funding will be allocated. We've already heard large annou announcements of billion dollar allocations from both the World Bank, the IMF and the African Development Bank. How that trickles down is gonna be the challenge. And I think we're gonna have to think of new partnerships on the ground to get the money quickly and efficiently to where it's needed the most. Yeah, great. Thank you, Joe. It looked like you had an answer. Yeah, no, I, I would echo a lot with, with uh, and Didi said, the, uh, I, I think the one, you know, obviously a big push by the major financial institutions have been to get money out there to help to, to uh, keep spending up levels up so that uh, small businesses are supported, that, that uh, we don't go into a very, very large recession. I mean, it looks like we are headed that way, but if we can minimize that to the degree possible, um, obviously, that's going to uh, minimize the number of people who are going to be unemployed or, or, you know, be pushed into poverty because of this. Uh, and we are looking at, at large numbers, I think. So I think the, the, the short term uh, influx of, 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 of money in, into this situation it will be very, very helpful. Uh, indeed, he also mentioned some of the more longer term or medium term things like insurance and other things that, that might be uh, uh, appropriate. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, 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 and Caitlin, if, oh, sorry, yep, go okay, ahead. I'm sorry, go could, ahead, I, could, I, could I tell you, because they both made very good points. And, and, you know, one of the sort of unintended consequences of all this is that that money doesn't make it to a lot of the, the communities that you described in your question. You know, what, what we're going to start to see is that um, if, if this is relatively short in duration, people are going to be switching to cheaper and less nutritious foods. And, and ultimately, the result of that is going to be an increase in, in nutrient deficiencies. And, and so, you know, this. So if we don't get funds to the right audiences in a pretty short amount of time, there's going to be a huge or a rather broad decline in calories that could result that could have an unintended consequence from this, this pandemic. So it's important that money gets in the right hands or gets to the people who need it the most. So we don't see a change in, in dietary behaviors and dietary patterns that could result in more longer term impacts. Yeah, and more susceptibility to even contracting COVID in the first place or other diseases in the first right. place. Yeah, um, uh, I'll return to um, to the to the um, first issue we discussed, which is export restrictions. Uh, so this will be the last um, question from the audience. I'll have one more question from the panelists, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, but my question: um, This is from uh, some uh, from some from Oxfam. Um, and it's essentially about, um, it's about how do we convince um, policymakers that um, what might, what they might think is good for their own country um, in terms of putting up an export restriction to retain more supplies for their own domestic consumption. Um, mm -hmm. How do we convince them that, um, mm -hmm. uh, that good, that what they might think is good politics is actually bad policy. So, so what are the mechanisms if, if we do see more countries putting up things like export restrictions, how do we convince them that it's, um, that it, it, it's bad policy. Well, one thing I think is 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 clear is is better information here really does help. I think uh, uh, if you're looking around locally and seeing um, uh, or are just concerned about uh, trying to ensure that there's enough food in your your uh, area, the 
the important thing is to to get a bigger picture of of you know world supplies. I mean, I, I think it is very tough, and don't don't get me wrong. I you look at some of the instances in 2007, 2008 were countries that that had very big shortfalls and were concerned about uh, available supplies. There are ways of doing meeting needs in a very targeted way that don't necessarily disrupt trade. And I think those are sort of the key things to, to look at here. But I think that, that better information certainly um, to ensure people that there are ample supplies in the world like there are right now. I think that, that th those are very important messages to get across. And there are institutions that are doing that. Um, I think the G20 members, for example, have been meeting on a monthly basis since 2011 um, of, you know, and sharing market information, looking at world market outlooks, um, and hopefully that will help um, uh, put off those sorts of moves. And I, I you know, even countries uh, that we've seen have put on these restrictions like Russia, I think the good news is that isn't a binding constraint right now. And hopefully they will uh, review the situation and decide that that is, doesn't need to be uh, uh, continued on uh, as their harvest comes in. Yeah, okay, good, thank you for that, Joe. Um, as a last question for all the panelists, I'd just like to ask you, what's a question that you would like, that, that you were not asked that you would like to answer? So what's the question and what's your, what answer would you give about this topic of COVID-19 and food security? Dana, Can I, like I'll, I'll go yeah. first? Yeah, I'll go first. I mean, I think I think it's the role that technology plays in farming. Um, you know, the, the, we've seen now uh, with people working from home in greater numbers, uh, the, the the need for technology in agriculture is far greater than it's ever been in the past. And so, uh, I, I would ask, uh, I, I would like to have been asked, is, you know, how does technology uh, create that certainty that the farmer craves? Uh, and and I, I think I touched on it earlier. It's that. You know, it, it provides access to market, it provides access to economy, uh, agronomy data, and it provides access to capital. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps we'll, we'll be focusing on that issue in the in the weeks and months to come. So thanks, Dana. I would have liked to be asked, um, what role can SMEs play in shaping their ecosystem and shaping policy? Uh, mm -hmm. Because a lot of us feel almost handicapped at this time. We don't know how we can get governments to listen to us. And we don't know what role we should be playing to ensure that the mistakes that are already been made don't get um, worsened by some uh, missteps in policy, not just in Africa, but across the world. And um, my response would be that I think we need to collaborate. I think this is an opportunity for industry associations um, if you don't belong to one, join one, get your voice heard, and actually come up with ideas and protocols and share them. Just yesterday, I mean, I learned that East Africa was coming up with great policies to promote trade, um, and ex especially the East Africa Grain Council. And uh, through AGRA and the Rockefeller Foundation, I was able to get some information, which I now have passed on to the Nigerian government, um, to say, guys, see what we can learn from what East Africa is doing to continue to promote trade and to ensure food security. And I think enough of us feel, you know, I'm just going to sit and fold my hands and let this happened to me and happened to my business, but I think we can shape policy. I mean, CSIS is doing a great thing through this type of uh, initiative and through the webinar, but I think a lot of us have to be more proactive and look at best practices and learn from what other countries are doing well and, what, and, and, and implement that, what we should avoid, let's escalate it and make a lot of noise and show the data that Joe talked about, because that data can be compelling to avoid some of our countries from the misstep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ndidi. And that's yet another example of a, some, uh, uh, something that we're seeing common between, between our countries. And that's the importance of SMEs, small and medium inter, medium uh, enterprises, in food security during the con during the pandemic. So thank you, Ndidi. Um, Joe, how about you? Yeah, no, I, I, there's, there's a good thing about going last is it gives you time to think about what questions you might want to ask. The danger is, is when <laughs> your predecessor, the people before you say what you wanted to say. So I, I, what, I, what I was going to add, uh, and I'll just add on to Ndidi's thing, is that I do think this has been a crisis that is, as you have said, is involved week by week. There's sort of a new problem each week, it seems like, that people are trying to grapple with. And I think that the uh, learning from others in this regard and in terms of how to um, uh, uh, make the supply chain more resilient uh, how to uh, you know how to address these 
health issues, very, very serious health issues and how to minimize risk for, you know, production and distribution of what is a very essential commodities like food um, is, is the real challenge here. And I think that, that um, uh, to the degree that we can learn from other experiences, I think it's really, really important. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, what, one thing that I've been thinking about since I started at CSIS, which was about a month ago, um, I started uh, just as soon as the pandemic was, uh, was being declared. And uh, my first day on the job was actually the first day of mandatory telework. So all of my work with CSIS has been remote. Um, but it, it, it's, it's occurred to me over the past month or so that, um, that what this is is a new reference point for us in terms of global food security. For, for the years that I was working on global food security at the State Department, um, we, we constantly hearkened back to 2007 and 2008, what that crisis was and what our response was. And this, we are in the midst of a different crisis and we're gonna look back at this. This is going to be a new reference point for us going forward, yeah. I think. Um, and I hope that the three of you will continue to be engaged with us um, to help, um, help our audience understand what's going on um, and to help us devise, um, help us give advice to policymakers on how to respond and how to promote food security in the midst of the pandemic. So again, I wanna thank our very expert panel for being with us today from around the world, from Lagos to Washington to Atlanta. Um, thank you, Ndidi, Joe, and Dana. Thanks very much. Um, and I also um, definitely don't want to forget to thank our fantastic team at CSIS. I'd like to thank the Global Food Security Team, Christian Mann, Eilish Zimbilchi, and Sydney Smith, and the very excellent CSIS External Relations Team for producing this event. Finally, I want to thank our audience for tuning in. For more information, please visit CSIS.org, and please follow us on Twitter at, at CSIS Food. Thank you. Thank you.